Greetings YouTubers, my name is PhD Tony and welcome to episode 2 of my new series, Seismic Data, a stake through the heart of Flat Earth. In this episode we're going to be discussing shear waves. There's not much else to discuss, so let's get into it. As you may or may not recall, in the previous episode we discussed in broad terms the application of an impulse to a medium. This impulse will impart energy to the material of the medium, and that energy will radiate from the focus of the impulse in a circular or spherical wavefront, very much like ripples spreading out on the surface of a pond. We also discussed that there are two broad categories of impulse that can be applied to the medium, one in which the force is parallel to the axis of the cylinder of material, or one in which the force is perpendicular to the axis of the cylinder of material. The former are called pressure or compressional waves, and we discussed them in the last episode. The latter are shear waves or S waves, and they're going to be the focus of our discussion today. In essence, shear waves propagate by shaking the cylinder up and down, sort of like a wave propagating along a rope when you shake the end up and down. Because each element of material within the cylinder is connected to its neighbours, when it is displaced upwards or downwards, it drags its neighbour upwards and downwards, and thus propagates the force that was applied to it. Because of their different mode of propagation, shear waves are much slower than P waves, and cannot travel through fluids such as gases or liquids. Everyday examples of this class of wave include the rope waves that I mentioned earlier, or the vibrations that are set up in percussion instruments when struck by a stick or a hammer. The fact that pressure waves and shear waves had different velocities is actually very useful. Normally, when seismic stations receive a signal, they have no idea what event caused it. They have no idea how far it was away, or when it happened, or how big it was. But similar to the P wave arrivals, we can identify when the P waves and when the S waves arrived at the receiver, and we can calculate the difference between them. From that difference, we can estimate the distance between the receiver and the seismic source. The more sites we use and the closer they are to the source, the more accurately we can determine the location of the source. We can then move on to determine the time at which the seismic event occurred and its magnitude. Flat earthers often like to claim that seismology simply isn't a scientific discipline because its methodology and results can't be tested. This is, of course, absolute rubbish. There are seismic events whose location and time and magnitude we know very exactly, and we can use these to verify our methodology. It is also not uncommon that patient and painstaking examination of the evidence may reveal subtle indicators of when and where an earthquake may have occurred, though such conspicuous mental agility is most probably beyond the average flat earther. Anyway, the arrival times for a variety of seismic phases, including P waves and S waves, have been exhaustively catalogued by seismologists over many decades. I've taken the liberty of highlighting the P wave arrival times with the red line and the S wave arrival times with the blue line. From the difference between the two sets of arrivals, we can estimate the path length along which the wavelet travelled in order to get from the source to the receiver. For any flat earthers in the audience wondering how one obtains angular distance between two sites, here's the formula. It should be carefully noted that all distance observations available to us, including and especially those due to seismic data, agree with spherical distance formulae. Anyway, returning to our attention to this phase diagram, it's interesting to note that the further away the receiver is from the source, the faster the wave seems to have travelled to get there. These arrival times are not a linear function of distance, which should be the case if the velocities were constant. So what's going on here? Well, quite simply, within Earth's mantle, P and S wave velocities aren't constant. As you go deeper in the mantle, the material becomes denser and seismic velocities increase. Incidentally, this has the side effect that downward propagating wave fronts refract. This would seem to explain why it is that P and S waves detected at receivers farther from the source seem to have travelled there faster than P and S waves that are detected closer to the source. But that's not the whole story. Now it's time to look at some geometry. If we know the depth of the seismic source and the surface separation between the source and the receiver, in the flat earth case we can calculate the distance that the wavefront must travel to get from the source to the receiver. It's a simple application of Pythagoras' theorem. If the source is at the surface, then things become even simpler. The distance from the source to the receiver that the wave must travel is simply the surface separation of the source and the receiver. 
In the spheroidal case, we can similarly calculate the straight line distance from a source at a given depth to a receiver at a given surface separation from the epicenter. The mathematics is a little more complicated in this instance, but boils down to a straightforward application of the cosine rule. Again, the mathematical formula for this distance becomes simpler if the source is at the surface of the spheroid. Just like in the last video, we now have two models for reality, one in which the Earth is flat and the other in which the Earth is spheroidal, and we can compare the straight line distances between source and receiver in both cases. Here I have plotted straight line distance between source and receiver as a function of surface separation between source and receiver for the two models. The spheroidal model is in red and the flat earth model is in blue. For a source receiver separation of 10,000 kilometers, the spheroidal straight line distance is 10% shorter than the flat earth straight line distance. So seismic energy traveling from the source to the receiver has a shorter path to cover in the spheroidal case than it does in the flat earth case. Not only is the path between source and receiver shorter in the spheroidal case, but it occurs at depth within the spheroid, where the P and S wave velocities are higher. So the P and S waves have less distance to travel, but they travel it at a higher velocity. Although the wave path travelled by the PNS waves is longer than the straight line distance, it is not significantly so because the effects of refraction are relatively modest. The greater the surface separation between source and receiver, the more significant the advantage in terms of material velocity is. The P waves travel faster and faster the further away the receiver is. In the flat earth case, the shortest path between source and receiver is always along the surface of the earth, where seismic waves are slowest. This model cannot therefore explain the observations. In order for the P waves and S waves to get deep into the mantle where they can enjoy the higher velocities, would greatly extend the length of the path that they travel, and would require extraordinary amounts of refraction in order for the waves to return to the surface. In short, flat earth models simply cannot be reconciled with the observational data we have for P wave and S wave arrival times, and we barely scratch the surface of what phases we have available to us and what they can tell us about the Earth's interior. So that's about all I have for today. The takeaway message that I want to impart is that the difference between P wave and S wave arrivals gives us an estimate of the path length that the waves have traveled along to get from the seismic source to the seismic receiver. There is simply no mechanism by which these observations can be reconciled with a flat earth geometry. The physics of it just don't pan out. On the other hand, the observational data fit extremely well to a spheroidal geometry, with no exotic physics needing to be invoked. So with that out of the way, thank you very much for watching. I really do appreciate it. I am trying to keep this series reasonably short and succinct. One of my many failures as a presenter is to try and pack too much into a video and make it confusing and long-winded. Anyway, I hope you'll join me next time when I'll introduce the mother of all flat earth bombs, Rayleigh waves.